Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers to celebrity memoirs, news, business, and self-development. Every month, members get one credit to pick any title, plus two Audible originals from a monthly selection, and access to daily news digests from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, as well as guided meditation programs. Between a full-time job in IT and a full-time job in podcasting, it gets harder and harder to sit down and read the books I'm interested in. This is where Audible comes in. I can listen on my daily commute, relaxing, or while out running errands and still get in the books I've been wanting to get into. You can download titles and listen offline anytime, anywhere. The app is free and can be installed on all smartphones and tablets. Now you can try Audible risk-free with a special 30-day free trial by visiting audibletrial.com forward slash nerdery and murdery. That's audibletrial.com forward slash nerdery and murdery. Don't let your busy life get in the way of that great book you've been wanting to read. Go get your free trial of Audible today. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. This is Jeffrey, and we've talked about many times before that I experience problems and struggles with my mental health. And really, without a healthy mind, being truly happy and at peace is hard. The good news is therapy does work. It's helped for me. But but what is is, is therapy exactly? It's it's whatever you want it to be. Maybe you're not feeling motivated right now and would like some tools to help. Or maybe you're feeling insecure in relationships at work or you're not dealing well with stress. Whatever you need, it's really time to stop being ashamed of normal human struggles. And, and it's time to start feeling better because you deserve to be happy. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you to help. BetterHelp is a customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. So join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is really about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. And there's a special offer to Nerdery and Murdery listeners. You can get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at betterhelp.com slash nerdery and murdery. That's betterhelp.com forward slash nerdery and murdery. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. Why? Why in the name of all that is holy? On the great planet of Barsoom, can they not make a decent movie out of these novels? They're a hundred years old! Welcome to episode 141 of Nerdery and Murdery. Big 141. I'm Zig with your Nerdery. And I'm Jeffrey with your Murdery. Welcome to another week of the highs and lows, the up, the down, the good, and the bad. Welcome to another week, everybody. We appreciate you all being here. Um, <clears throat> I watched all of the uh, the What If season two. Oh, you did? I haven't even I haven't even hit it up yet. Not as good as season one. Okay. Um so there can't remember if the first one's connected to everything or not I, I i don't think the first one's connected to all of it but but all all the other episodes are pretty much connected going towards uh going towards the end and it's and it you know they're setting up for season 3 this season centered largely around uh Peggy Carter okay um Peggy Carter I do too. It's it's a really good character, but this this season is centered largely around here. Plus, a character I'd never heard about. Who? Uh, K- K- Kahori. Kahori, I think her name is. Um, I, I don't remember. I think it's Kahori, but anyway, it's uh, it. I didn't think they were as good as season one. I can tell you that for sure. Um, I actually fell asleep during one of them. Um. <laughs> 
uh but uh, but but i got through those uh, you know give it give it a watch let, let us know what you okay. think think on it um uh I, I i think they're i think they're interesting enough but uh, but they did a much better job with season season one for sure um but yeah the, that's 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 all i have uh what 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 what, what, what do you got uh not a lot going on here uh finally finishing up some of the construction even though it's been you know like two years uh mm -hmm. it's it's almost there that's good i'm glad I, I know you'll be happy to be done with that i remember when we yeah. did some remodeling of our former house i i got tired of being under construction all the time all the time yes it, it, it gets annoying and ready to be done with it and everything so um awesome well I, so I am not as familiar with this topic that you're talking about, except for the movie. And I'll uh -huh. save my opinions when we get to that. Uh, but Zig, I was actually you, two. Uh, I was completely unaware of that. Zig, I'll let yeah. you take over on the nerdy side of the house. Okay. Today, we're going to talk about John Carter of Mars. I know people are like, oh, that movie wasn't that great. You're right. That movie wasn't that great. It wasn't. It's, and that's the thing. I didn't like the movie. It's based on a series of novellas from the early 20th century. Um, so I need to borrow the pod back machine for a second. We're going to go back to the early 90s. I'm reading a lot of Robert Hyman, just because that's what I was into at the time. And I pick up Number of the Beast, and they keep referring to these characters, John Carter and Deja Thoris and all this other stuff. And they mention this series of books. Uh, one of the characters was actually named Deja Thoris. Um, that Edgar Rice Burroughs, creator of Tarzan, wrote back in the early teen or late teens, early twenties. Uh, it was called ostensibly uh, it's uh, John Carter of Mars, a and it's a uh, it's fictional Virginia soldier who acts as the initial protagonist of the Barsoom series. A uh, veteran of the American Civil War, he is transported to the planet Mars called Barsoom by its inhabitants, where he becomes a warrior battling various myth mythological beasts, alien armies, and malevolent foes. It was originally created in 1911. The character has appeared in novels and short stories, comic books, television shows, and films, including the 2012 feature film John Carter, which marked the 100th anniversary of the character's first appearance. The novellas were A Princess of Mars, The Gods of Mars, The Warlords of Mars, Thuvia Maid of Mars, The Chessmen of Mars, The Mastermind of Mars, the Fighting Man of Mars, Swords of Mars, Synthetic Men of Mars, Lana of Gathol, and John Carter of Mars. So it's like 12, 12 little novellas. They're like 150 pages a piece, real short, but they're great adventure stories. Um and again, I picked them up because I was reading Number of the Beast, and I, and I picked up the first one. I thought it was great. And I read the second one, and it was great. And the third one, and it was great. Um, a lot of pseudoscience going on here. But again, they were written in 1911. We hadn't been to Mars yet. Um, but the idea was that Mars is inhabited, but it is slowly dying. Um, it had once had water all over it. Now it only has water in a few places. And the people that live there are basically contending with living on a desert world with lower gravity than we have here. So there are lots of airships. Uh, they have uh, some of their science is way behind ours. It's from the Bronze Age. Some of their science is, you know, a couple of hundred years in the future. Uh, they know of Earth. They know that people came from Earth uh, originally. Uh, there are also inhabitants that develop on Mars, you know, as actual in, in, inhabitants, but they're all they all live in the same society. Now, you get remnants of of ancient cities that used to be by the sea, which no longer exist. Um, it's on the rim of a canyon in a desert that was originally an inland sea or a lake. Um, it just really, really fascinating. Mostly it's an adventure story. Um, a lot of sword and sandal, uh, a lot of damsels in distress, things like that nature. Again, written in 1911. Um, but the the lead character, John Carter, uh, 
Uh, he basically he's being chased down by uh, by a bunch of bandits. I think in the original film they were uh, natives because he was he was where he wasn't supposed to be. Um, and this originally appeared in a pulp magazine. It was collected into a a, a novella called The Princess of Mars in 1917. But he originally started the story in 1911. So John Carter sort of uh, goes into this cave and finds this weird, uh, this weird mummy there who appears to be alive. Uh, but it looks like he's been there for 100 years. He's covered in cobwebs and he touches this spot in the wall and he's transported to Mars. Um, at the end of Princess of Mars, he ends up being transported back like 12 years later and he is covered in dust and, and, and cobwebs and things, but he's still alive. Um, the book centers around a young, well, proponently Edgar Rice Burroughs reading the stories from his uncle uh, about what happened to him and how he's been trying to get back to Mars for years and years and years. And it's after his uncle's funeral. By the end of the book, he goes into the crypt where his uncle is, and he's not dead. He's gone back to Mars. And the next book picks up with him getting back to Mars after a period of time. Um, the world of Mars is ruled by uh, the second book, The Gods of Mars, which are a group of humans who, who basically started a religion to kind of keep themselves on top. Um, and uh, everybody goes to this one basically underground sea when they die what they don't realize is the <laughs> the humans who are there are eating them when they get there or using them as slave labor um the third you've got the warlord of mars where he basically returns from what is essentially the afterlife of mars um and then the the story kind of takes the, the story kind of takes from the persona of the princess of mars Deja Thoris, and john carter's son uh Cthoris, and it's his story and uh it kind of goes back and forth a little bit but again there's 12 books in the barsoom series um he wants to initially he meets this martian princess who's been captured named Deja Thoris. Uh, she is a princess of the city of Helium. Um, but after several years of marriage, uh, he sacrifices himself to save Barsoom because there are these giant, there are these giant temples uh, that also produce oxygen, which is what's keeping the planet alive um, because it's slowly losing all its atmosphere. Um, I'm just as bored as the movie right now. <laughs> Are you really? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to find a. I'm trying to explain it. It's hard to explain. I've got a bunch of notes, but I don't want to just read a bunch of notes. Um, so on Mars, there are the green men of Mars. The green men of Mars are the original um, inhabitants of Mars. The, 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 they, uh, they're very tall. They're insect-like. They have six appendages. That's two arms and or four arms and two legs. Um, and they are essentially uh, wild men. They live they live nomadic lifestyles. You have what are called the red men of Mars, which are the people of helium uh, because they are very tan because they live in a desert. Uh, you have what they call the yellow men of Mars. Uh, they live up in the polar north. Um, and it's just as descriptive. Uh, you have the therns, um, which are the uh, purported to be the gods. They're very pale because they live in the under, under the underground kingdom. They are beholden to uh, the first men of Mars, the dark men of Mars. Uh, there are people who... Uh, basically look aboriginal 
um, they're very, very dark skinned, uh, and they actually control everything over the therns. Uh, the people on Mars live a long time because, again, they have they have this really incredible science, but they also fight with swords and things uh, because the planet is is dying and being kept alive by artificial means. Um, there are great beasts that they fight. Uh, the the green men of Mars ride these amazing beasts, which are not only uh, mounts, but they're also ferocious fighters. Um, a lot of sentient creatures on Mars. And again, there's a bunch of humans, but they're basically just, depending on where they live, that's what they look like. Um, it's, and they've got this weird casteism. But again, it's because the planet is slowly dying. Um, there's very little water, but there are canals that run back and forth between the great cities. The great cities often will fight each other. But like uh, John Carter is really good friends with Dejah Thoris's great grandfather, who looks the same age as John Carter, uh, because they have very, very long lives. Um, another character, uh, one other Earthman, Ulysses Paxton, is able to travel to Var Mars via the method Carter used. Um, and he meets up with Thuvia, made of Mars, which is the grandson of or the granddaughter of John Carter. Um, no, no, Thuvia is John Carter's daughter. Their daughter, Ulysses Paxton, and Thuvia is Lenal of Gothel. I'm confused. Um, but yeah, this is just great little adventure stories where people are running around fighting um, half-naked women, uh, monsters, <laughs> uh, damsels in distress, um uh, there are a few strong female characters uh the the leader of the uh the first men of mars is actually a very 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 old woman um they say she's like 5000 years old um but the thing about this series it has inspired so many other science fiction writers um it inspired you know some of these ideas inspired the fremen uh for frank herbert um Star Wars gets some inspiration for it, you know, the, the fighting with the swords and things like that. Uh Star Trek got some inspiration from it, as well as Robert Heinlein, Larry Niven, and Jack McDevitt, and all these other science fiction writers all read this stuff when they were kids, and he's kind of the godfather of the science fiction movement. I mean, you know, Forrest Ackerman. The problem comes with this is they tried to make movies of this in the, well, again, about 10 years ago. Well, and you said that there were two of them. One yes. got released. As I'm looking online, two yep. got canceled. No, no, no. There was another movie called Princess of Mars with uh, Anthony Sabato. Really? Why is it not listed as a John Carter movie? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it, it went straight to video. Uh, Thuvia was played by, uh, oh my God. She used to be a, a, an adult film actress and moved over to regular film. Which character? Uh, she played Dejah Thoris. Uh, Lynn Collins. No, 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 no. This was in the, 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 the one with Anthony, the Princess of Mars movie with Anthony Sabato. Yeah. I've got it here. I'm looking at it. Princess of Mars. And it shows... Uh, Deja Thoris, uh, the 2009 film Princess of Mars, which Tracy Lords. Oh, oh, like okay. Deja Thoris. It was actually some of the stuff with the Green Men of Mars was actually better in that than it was in the 2012 film, uh, John Carter, uh, which was played by Taylor Kitsch and uh, Lynn Collins played Deja Thoris, huh. uh, which was done by Disney and failed miserably. Bob Clamp at the animator wanted to produce a full length cartoon of John Carter of Mars in the 1930s and talked with Burroughs about it. Several seconds of animation do appear in the supplemental material for the home video version of the Disney film. I have included some of that in our YouTube playlist. Um, they threw a lot of money at this. At this movie, <laughs> um, but. I get the sense that when they made it, they didn't read the source material. Mm -hmm. 
you know, it's it's almost like uh, it's almost like they were afraid to 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 go off on it because it was from the turn of the century. Um, you know, there's some weird ideas there. That he kind of portrays, you know, Native Americans as savages in the first few pages. Um, turns out John Carter was in was someplace he wasn't supposed to be anyway. So, you know, calling them savages is, you know, not really nice. Um, because they were defending their their territory. He was someplace where he wasn't supposed to be. Um, and you John Carter also crops up. He makes two appearances in Alan Moore's The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Uh, the first is a story by Alan and uh and Sundell Vale, which they appear at the end of volume one. In this story, Moore claims that H.P. Lovecraft's Rand Randolph Carter is a descendant of John Carter. Carter also appears in the beginning of volume two, helping the Barsoomians fight against the Martians from the War of the Worlds. Um, the same scenario also appears in the Burroughs entry in the War of the Worlds Global Dispatch Anthology. It includes one of the protagonists of Robert Heinlein's The Number of the Beast, Captain Zebediah John Carter, uh, whose wife is also Deja Thor Deja Thoris or Dee Dee. Um, the similarity in names is noted with the novel since all of the major characters are fans of vintage science fiction. In Saturn's Children by Charlie or uh, Charles Strauss, Barsoom and Carter City are names of the settlements on Mars. And in Philip Jose Farmer's World of, of Tears novels, the moon circling the world of tears is modeled after Barsoom from Edgar Rice Burroughs' novel as an homage, which Farmer openly admits in the third book of the series. Dan Simon's Hyperion. Uh, as well, with Frederick Casson turned 18, he was offered the choice of serving as a Martian polar work camp or enlisting with the John Carter Brigade, a volunteer task force seeking to aid forces against the Glennon High Rebellion on Mars. In Harry Turtledove's Southern Victory series final novel, uh, Settling Accounts, uh, in at the death, a character named John Carter of the Tarkas Estate, because the green man that he becomes friends with is named Tars Tarkas. Um, appears before a U.S. general after having protected African-Americans from genocide taking place elsewhere. And the Object Compass in E.E. E. Doc uh, Smith's Skylark series is very similar to the Barsoomian Destination Compass. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people have used the John Carter, Mar uh, John Carter persona. And you in the in the novellas, you also get to explore other parts of Mars. There is a small section of jungle, which they explore in the chessmen um, a little bit. Uh, the chessmen are another sentient species of Mars where they're basically parasitic heads that basically build synthetic bodies to walk around on, uh, sort of tentacled beasts. Um uh, but I mean, through the novellas, you you discovered that that Mars at one point was a was an egalitarian society with all these sentient beings, and that as the atmosphere started to go and some of the water started to leave, it descended into chaos. This was you know ten thousand years before John Carter even got there, um, and what you're what you're dealing with now is a post apocalyptic society, and a lot of people in the post-apocalyptic genre kind of portray their characters and things like the Barsoomians. Um, so it inspired people that way as well. I love the series of books, uh, particularly the ones in the 1990s uh, where the, the covers were designed by uh, some well-known science fiction uh, painters, uh, I, I think they're 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 awesome. Um, I love the stories. I and I've gone back and read them again five or six years ago. I have a two volume set of the first two books. Loved it, loved it, loved it. Just reading through it, it was like it was like magic again. Um, um, but yeah. Oh, Michael Whelan was the one that did the. Most people think of Boris Vallejo and things like that. Michael Whelan did the covers in the early to mid '90s. Those are the ones I love the best because they really portray the Green Men of Mars as as, as epic and amazing. But yeah, that's that's basically it for John Carter Mars. I know I haven't said much. <laughs> um, oh yeah, 
just trying to sneak by. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, uh, I I saw I saw the first I, I saw the movie John John mm-hmm. Carter and and I just I, I was bored to tears. So I didn't like it at all. Did not like it at all, and so I I, I wouldn't have gone on to a second one. <laughs> even well, I, you might want to check out the Princess of Mars. It's a little it's a little bit closer to the book, but they didn't have half the budget that Disney had, so. Mm-hmm. Well, and it was a box office bomb too, because yeah. final final reports were that John Carter cost, w- including marketing, three hundred and fifty million uh, mm-hmm. to make, and it made less than that in the box office. It made less yes. than three hundred million, and they yeah. said it would have need to needed to have made six hundred million in order to be a success, and it it led to resignations at Disney. Yes. And, uh, and another thing is the the marketing of it was considered extremely terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, and and what was not known at the time is when this D- Disney basically didn't put a lot behind this because behind the scenes at the time, Disney was already in talks to buy Lucasfilms. Yes. So, yes, yes. It's like, OK, we're going to start doing this. Yeah, and, oh, hey, we're back. We're going to buy Lucasfilms. We don't really don't need to showcase uh, John Carter of Mars now, right? Uh, even though they've been working on it for three, four years, right. um, the movie just wasn't that good. No, I've watched it a couple of times. Again, I like the cast. Um, Willem Dafoe as Tars Tarkas is perfect. I like the designs and everything else of the the Green Men of Mars, but they don't really get into the the civilization. And they don't talk about how, because, you know, when they're in the opening scene, when when he comes across the the green men and they're in that abandoned city. They don't ever go into the abandoned city and see the pictures of the wall of the green men and the red men and the the therns and everybody else basically all living together because they're great big murals all over these cities. And and how they used to sit at the edge of the sea. None of that. None of that at all. And that they, they could have done that with, with two minute shot. No, instead mm-hmm. they, they had to have the green men fighting, which they do. They do a lot, but I mean there's there's more to it than that. Right. Well, you know how I feel about it. So, you know, listeners, go out there, see John Carter for yourself, read the books, see what you feel about it. Yeah. Um you know, you can you can let us know, um, yeah. you know, email us, get us on Facebook, anything like that. Let us know how you felt about it and we'll go from there. <laughs> yes, it's I will say this. I love the books, uh, particularly up till about five or six. Mm-hmm. It kind of dropped off there, but toward the end, they picked right back up. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first four books are amazing. I mean, again, they're they're novellas. They're tiny. But I mean, Edgar Rice's Edgar Rice Burroughs' ability to paint the picture of that society is what makes that so wonderful. Mm-hmm. That's cool. You know, speaking of books, uh, com- completely not related at all. But I was uh, I was just looking some stuff up online the other day, uh, and and I was reading the reviews for Ready Player Two because uh-huh. uh, I was curious what the masses thought about ready player two because ready player one i love ready player one i love yeah. that book i've read it time and time and time again and while the movie strayed from the book quite a bit i thought it was still a decent enough movie that i've watched a few times because I, uh-huh. I just i just enjoy it i think that it was really good ready player two i didn't like you didn't like the book at all? I didn't really like the book at all. Um, I thought it was very derivative. I hated what they did with the characters. Um, and 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 as I was reading reviews online, most people agreed with me on that because there is a Ready Player Two movie in uh in the works. Mm-hmm. Um and I just I wish instead of that, because I didn't think that was that great of a book. I wish they would do a movie over another of Ernst Klein's books, Armada. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, what? Armada. Armada. Okay. You need to read Armada. Um, uh, uh, basically, 
kind of think the last starfighter uh-huh taken up a notch oh nice um you you give armada a read it's really really good i i enjoyed armada a lot but but ready player two i didn't so sorry i didn't mean to go off tangent that it just reminded yeah, me i was we were talking about books man researching about doing doing some research on ready player two just the other day nice all right awesome well thank you for your time on that i appreciate it even if i don't like the movies i appreciate the time you take on that you should try the novellas man like Eh, i said they're 150 pages maybe i might uh with that i'll step over to the murdery side of the house murder uh for today for today i got my information off all that's interesting wikipedia new york Times, the new york times and forensics tales and this is the story of john list john list familiar with him I've heard the name. I don't doubt it. Uh, it's it's been a while since we've covered uh, a family annihilator. Um, so mm-hmm. here here's another one for you, and he's one of the most famous ones. Okay, that's Very probably famous. why I've heard his name. I'm sure you have. Uh, so on November 9th, nineteen seventy one, John List shot his wife, his mother, and his three children. Then he made a sandwich, drove to the bank, and disappeared for eighteen years. Holy shit! Well, so born in Bay City, Michigan, uh, John List was the only child of German-American parents, John Frederick List and Alma Barbara Florence List. Like his father, John was a devout Lutheran and Sunday school teacher. He graduated from Bay City Central High School in 1943. And then that same year, he enlisted in the United States Army and served as a laboratory technician during World War II. Uh, His father died in 1944. And then List was discharged in 1946, and he enrolled in the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, where he earned a bachelor's degree in business administration and a master's degree in accounting, and was commissioned a second lieutenant through the ROTC. In November of 1950, as the Korean War escalated, uh, John List was recalled to active military service. Uh, At Fort Eustis in Virginia, he met Helen Morris Taylor, who was the widow of an infantry officer killed in action in Korea. Uh, who lived nearby with her daughter, Brenda. John and Helen married on December 1st, 1951 in Baltimore, Maryland, and the family moved to Northern California. Later, according to trial testimony, Helen had pressured List into marriage by falsely claiming she was pregnant, then insisted they marry in Maryland, which did not require the premarital syphilis test mandated in, in most other states at the time. Uh, Though her health progressively deteriorated, she said nothing to List or her physicians until 1961, when a thorough examination revealed the condition. And by then, progression of the disease combined with her excessive alcohol consumption had, had, according to testimony, quote, transformed her into an unkept and paranoid recluse, who frequently and often publicly humiliated List, comparing his sexual prowess unfavorably with that of her first husband. Hmm. Uh, The Army, uh, recognizing John's accounting skills, reassigned him to the Finance Corps, and after completion of his second tour of 1952, uh, John List worked for an accounting firm in Detroit and then as an adult uh, or an audit supervisor at a paper company in Kalamazoo where his three children were born. By 1959, uh, John had risen to general supervisor of the company's accounting department, but Helen, an alcoholic, had become increasingly unstable due to syphilis Uh, that she had contracted from her first husband, which, again, she did not disclose to John before their marriage. In 1960, his stepdaughter Brenda married and left the household, and John moved with the remainder of his family to Rochester, New York, to take a job with Xerox. There, he eventually became director of accounting services, and in 1965, he accepted a position as vice president and comptroller at a bank in Jersey City, New Jersey, and moved with his wife, children, and mother into Breeze Knoll, which was a 19-room Victorian mansion located at 431 Hillside Avenue in Westfield, New Jersey. The New Jersey mansion he inhabited included a ballroom, marble fireplaces, and a Tiffany skylight. Wow. John List appeared to be the perfect son, husband, and father. He worked hard as an accountant at a nearby bank to provide for his family. John and his family were the embodiment of the American dream in 1965. They attended church every Sunday as devout Lutherans, and John taught Sunday school, as I'd mentioned before. And everything looked great on the surface, but almost nothing was as it seemed. 
1971, John lost his job at the bank at age 46, and subsequent jobs didn't pan out. He couldn't bear to tell his family about the loss of income, and to avoid sharing this humiliating development with his family, John engaged in the same routine and dress as when employed, leaving home each morning on schedule and spending the day at job interviews or at the Westfield train station reading newspapers until it was time to come home. He was also secretly skimming money from his mother's bank accounts to pay the mortgage. He refused to go on welfare as it would entail excruciating embarrassment in the community and violate the principles of self-sufficiency that he learned at his father's knee. As the year progressed, the family's financial problems became more strained. John encouraged his children to seek part-time work, ostensibly to teach them maturity and responsibility, but in actuality to help keep the family financially solvent. Furthermore, his children were dabbling with marijuana and theater, both of which uh, John viewed as rather unchristian, and he was watching his perfect life unravel. <clears throat> it's really kind of hard to believe the solution uh, he arrived would have been more acceptable to his father, but John List would later say it seemed the only option, the murder of his mother, wife, and children. On November 9, 1971, John put what was a carefully calculated plan into action. A few weeks before, he had ordered a family meeting where he cryptically asked them each what type of funeral they would want. In the days prior, he had mailed notes to friends, co-workers, and teachers of his various family members, offering up cover stories as to why they wouldn't be seen in coming weeks. Then John shot and killed his wife, Helen, his 16-year-old daughter, Patricia, his 15-year-old son, John, his 13-year-old son, Frederick, and his mother, Alma, who was aged 85. They were all shot methodically one by one. Helen was shot first, uh, but John saw the children off to school and then shot her in the back of the head in the kitchen as she sipped her customary morning coffee. Then he went up to the third floor and murdered his mother in her bed. He gave her one final kiss and then shot her in the back of the head. He then went to the post office and the bank and then returned home to wait for his children. He killed Patricia when she returned home from school, then the youngest son, Frederick. He made himself a sandwich, closed out his bank accounts, and then went and cheered for his only surviving son, John, at his high school soccer game. He gave John a oh. ride home and then shot him in the chest repeatedly. Dude! So the reason for this, John reportedly survived the first shot, and John List would later state that he didn't want his son to suffer, so he shot him multiple times. Uh, John then laid the bodies of his family on top of sleeping bags in the ballroom in the shape of a T and then composed a note to his pastor who he felt would understand. He left his mother's body in the apartment in her attic and he explained in a note he left behind that she was too heavy to move. Helen's mother was in fact ill and had canceled a visit to Westfield because of it. And had she and 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 had she had later made the trip, uh, John later said she would have been his sixth victim. He feared his family, confronted with a world full of evil and poverty, would turn from God, and this was the only way to ensure their safe arrival in heaven. He was not, however, willing to suffer the earthly consequences for his actions, and in an effort to baffle the police, he cleaned the crime scenes and used scissors to remove his image from every photo in the mansion. He canceled all deliveries and contacted his children's schools to let their teachers know the family would be on vacation for a few weeks. He turned on the lights and the radio, leaving religious hymns playing in the house's empty rooms, and he slept in the mansion where his family lay dead, then walked out the door the next morning and wasn't seen again for 18 years. Huh. About a month passed before neighbors, who were curious about the constantly burning lights and empty windows, began to suspect something was wrong at the mansion. And when authorities entered the Westfield, uh, New Jersey house on December 7th, 71, they heard organ music piped through the intercom system. They also found the five-page note that from John List explaining that the bloody bodies on the ballroom floor were his family members killed out of mercy. List wrote that he saw too much evil in the world and he had ended the lives of his mother, his wife, mother, and children to save their souls. Uh, there was a nationwide manhunt that was launched. Uh, not only did the police have five bodies and the murder weapon, but a handwritten confession from the killer in reference to each one and police investigated hundreds of leads but had no success. 
The FBI found his car parked at Kennedy International Airport in New York City, but they never found him, nor was there any evidence he boarded a flight. There was simply no trace of him in the United States or overseas. Uh, John List had planned the murders and escaped perfectly, and he managed to disappear into thin air before anyone even knew the, the horrific acts which he had committed, and then the trail went cold. Fast forward 18 years to 1989, and New Jersey prosecutors had come up with a new plan. They had a for an expert forensics artist, artist, Frank Bender, create a physical bust of John List as Bender managed, managed, imagined he might have aged. Uh, Bender gave him a hawk nose, grizzled eyebrows, and horn rim glasses, and psychologists theorized that John would wear the same spectacles he wore as a younger man to remind him of those more successful days, and it was a masterful depiction of John List. When America's Most Wanted aired the story of John of the John List murders on May 21st, 1989, an audience of 22 million saw Frank Bender's sculpture, and then tips started pouring in. One tip came from a woman in Richmond, Virginia, who thought her next-door neighbor, Robert Clark, bore a striking resemblance to the bust. The tipster said her neighbor was also an accountant and attended church. Authorities went to the Clark's home and spoke with his wife, whom he had met at a church social gathering, and her story put an end to the 18-long year, 18-year-long mystery. It turned out that List had changed his identity and moved to Colorado under the assumed name Robert Clark, and the alias worked where he kept it when he moved to Richmond. In 1971, as the FBI later discovered, uh, John had traveled by train from New Jersey first to Michigan, then to Colorado. He settled in Denver in early 1972 and took an accounting job under the name Robert Peter Bob Clark, one of his cl college classmates, uh, although the, late, the real Bob Clark later stated he had never known John List. From 1979 to 1986, he was the comptroller at a paper box manufacturer outside of Denver. He joined a Lutheran congregation and ran a carpool for church members without transport. At one religious gathering, he met an Army PX clerk named Dolores Miller, and they were married in 1985. In February of 1988, the couple moved to a house in the Brander Mill neighborhood of Midlothian, Virginia, where John List, still using the name Bob Clark, resumed work as an accountant at a small accounting firm, Madrea, Joyner, Kirkham, and Woody. In 1972, John List was proposed as a suspect in the D.B. Cooper air piracy case because of the timing of his disappearance, which was two weeks prior to the airline hijacking. Multiple matchers to the hijacker's description and the reasoning that a fugitive accused of mass murder has nothing to lose. Didn't they, haven't they found him like recently, the, the real D.B. Cooper? I think you're right on that. Something, something triggers. Yeah, me and it was, it was right. something, it was something like, yeah, yeah you guys were right. I, that, I par parachuted out the back. I was fine. You know, I, but he's I, like dead now, but they I think finally were right. able to piece it all together. I may have to look that up. Um, John List was questioned by FBI investigators after his capture, but he denied any any involvement in the Cooper case. Yeah, uh, his name is still occasionally mentioned in Cooper articles and documentaries, but there's no direct evidence that implicates him, and the FBI no longer considers him a suspect. I'll have to look that up about DB Cooper. Uh, police in Virginia arrested uh, mass murderer John List on June first, nineteen eighty nine, a mere nine days after America's Most Wanted aired the case. That show was great. Mm -hmm. uh, John List continued to stand by his alias for several months, even after his 1989 extradition to Union County, New Jersey. And finally, faced with irrefutable evidence, including a fingerprint match with John's military records, as well as evidence found at the crime scene, he confessed his true identity on February 16, 1990. Um, at his trial in 1990, defense lawyers argued that List suffered from PTSD from his military service in World War II in Korea. Expert psychologists believed, rather, that List was going through a midlife crisis, and as the prosecution pointed out, there was no excuse for killing five innocent people. His defense lawyers also tried painting John List as a man whose parents forced religion upon him, pushing him into life insanity, but the jury didn't buy it. On April 12, 1990, John List was convicted of five counts of first-degree murder. At his sentencing hearing, he denied direct responsibilities for his actions, saying, quote, I feel that because of my mental state at the time, I was unaccountable for what happened. I ask all affected by this for their forgiveness, understanding, and prayer. 
the judge. Great, but, great, great, but you you also covered it up and ran away for eighteen years. Exactly, exactly. I mean, the judge was unpersuaded. He said, "Quote." John Emil List is without remorse and without honor. After 18 years, five months, and 22 days, it is now time for the voices of Helen, Alma, Patricia, Frederick, and John F. List to rise from the grave. He imposed a sentence of uh, of five terms of life imprisonment to be served, served consecutively, the maximum permissible penalty at the time. Uh, John List filed an appeal for his convictions again on the grounds that his judgment had been impaired by the post-traumatic stress disorder due to his military service. And he also argued that the letter he left behind at the crime scene, essentially his confession, was confidential communication to his pastor and therefore inadmissible in evidence. A federal appeals court rejected both arguments. <laughs> um, in an interview with Connie Chung in 2002, John List said he didn't kill himself after killing his own family because he felt that would prevent him from getting to heaven. All John wanted to do was was reunite with his wife, mother, and children in the afterlife, where he believed there would be no pain and suffering. And also during the interview, he finally expressed a degree of remorse for his crime, saying, quote, I wish I had never done what I did. Uh, while in his remaining days behind the walls of a New Jersey, New Jersey state correctional facility, John List still hoped that he would go to heaven and, and prayed to this uh, to this end every day. He also expressed hope to meet his family in the afterlife. He said, quote, when we get to heaven, they'll either have forgiven me or won't realize what happened. I'm sure that if we recognize each other, we'll like each other's company, just like we did here when times were better. John List did die of complications from pneumonia at age 82 on March 21st, 2008, while in prison at St. Francis Medical Center in Trenton, New Jersey. In reporting his death, the New Jersey Star-Ledger referred to him as the Boogeyman of Westfield. Uh, the mansion in New Jersey where John List lived with his family burned down several months after the murders. Authorities never found the cause of the fire, and a new house was built on the property years later. Although this destruction was officially ruled arson, it remains unsolved with no, uh, with no suspects. Destroyed along with the home was the ballroom stained glass skylight. Uh, hmm. which was rumored to be a signed Tiffany original, worth at least $100,000 at the time, or equivalent to 700000 today. Yep. And, and what's really sad is when they bought it from Tiffany, you know, the, the people originally, yeah, it was probably expensive, but, it, you know, it wasn't anything more expensive than, oh, hey, I'm going to get a, you know, a skylight up here. Uh, right. I'm going to get it in stained glass. So Right. Yeah. <sighs> Uh, the memory of the murder still haunt the Westfield residents. In an interview in 2008, parents told a reporter in New Jersey that children will not walk past the property, nor that they, do they even want to live on the same street. Wow. Uh, over the years, John List and his crimes have furnished inspiration for documentaries, television dramas, and feature films. Examples include Savior, Season 6, Episode 16 of the television series Law & Order. The 1987 film *The Stepfather* and its 2000 remake, 2009 remake. The 1993 film *Judgment Day*, the John List story in which jo uh, John List was portrayed by Robert Blake, and the character Kaiser Soze in the 1995 film *The Usual Suspects* is based off John List. Kaiser Soze. Yep. Uh, 1996 episode of the series *Forensics Files* discussed the List murder. Uh, there was a 2003 episode of the A&E series American Justice, which also detailed the case and featured an interview with John List. In 2015, the story was covered in the season two, episode two of the Investigation Discovery series, Your Worst Nightmare. Uh, the episode Murder House premiered on November 18th, 2015. A movie, The Killer, A Killer Next Door, is based on the events that led to the capture of John List and was released in July of 2020. And finally, in 2022, Netflix released a seven-part dramatic fictional series called *The Watcher*. Uh, although it's a work of fiction, much of the character of John, uh, much of the character John Graff was borrowed from the story of the John List murders. Uh, the character of John Graff was played by Joe Mantel Man Mantello, and was identical to John List in several ways, such as in being an accountant, attending a Lutheran church, and murdering his family and living mother, along with leaving music playing in the house and playing an alibi that would cause the bodies to remain undiscovered for several weeks. And that's the story of John List. Well, thank you, sir. That was fascinating. 
Yeah. One of the most famous family annihilators. We've covered uh, 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 at least a couple of them before, maybe mm-hmm. maybe three. But John List is one of the one of the most famous. I've had him um, uh, on my uh, on, on my list of, of stories to tell for some time now. So finally dove into that one. So awesome. Thanks. For, thanks for taking that journey with me. Uh, thank you. That'll take us to the end of another recording week. As always, you can find uh, find more about us on our website, nerderymurder.com. That's our hub, our website for everything uh, about the show. We have links to what we talked about in this episode, plus pictures uh, about the topic we discussed. Uh, you can also find the link to our YouTube page, which is so often updates. Yes, our YouTube page, which will have uh, videos of things that we talked about, some snippets from the movie, some of the stuff from the other things and, and things that we think are fun. Awesome. As well as uh, for our music episodes, we also have Spotify play- playlists. Yes. So you can go and listen to music and the episode. Yes. Appreciate your work on that. Thank you. Uh, also on our website, you can find the link to our merchandise where if you wish to show off your Nerdery Murdy fandom, please do consider purchasing some merchandise there. You can also find the link to our Patreon where our patrons, along with our our merchandise uh, sales, do go to the cost of this show. It helps us, helps uh, helps us keep going. There are costs that are associated with keeping the show on the air, so please do consider some merchandise, purchasing some merchandise, or becoming a a patron to our show. We appreciate each and every one of you. Please and thank you. Please and thank you. And last but not least, please don't forget to leave a five star review wherever you can. It helps us and helps others find our content to hear the topics we we're discussing. So with that, I have been Zig with your nerdery. And I'm Jeffrey with your murdering. Cue the music.